Good morning. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Bennington. My name is John Brigham, Pastor John from, uh, from Whitingham, and I'm, as most of you know, uh, one, of the, one of the clergy, one of the teachers and pastors that, uh, that are leading your congregation at this point, and helping to feed you and worship with you on Sunday mornings. It's, it's, a, it's a blessing for me. Uh, as a retired pastor, although you never retire, uh, but you, the Lord just sort of changes the ministry at times. Yesterday I did a wedding, and have a wedding coming up, and, uh, but, uh, but I enjoy being among you at this time and, and uh, hopefully encourage you in God's word and worship with you. It's good to be together. Amen. And is Charlie? Do you have a, a song for us this morning? Uh, okay, would you you can do that right? Now, let me open with prayer first. And Father, we're thankful that uh, we can come into this church building as the body of Christ, Lord, the redeemed. How we love to proclaim it. And Lord, I thank you for those that have gathered. I ask, Lord, that your spirit would be among us, the Holy Spirit would be upon us, and that uh, the presence of Christ would be real to us as we're here. And, and we need you, Lord, and we have you. So I ask that Christ would be exalted in this service this morning, and that the people of God would be encouraged. For it is in the name of Jesus that I pray this prayer and we gather this morning. Amen and amen. Charlie. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure. Thank you, Charlie. That was uh, that was precious. It really was. Guess you shouldn't touch those things. I have problems with mics sometimes. That was uh, of all the weddings that I've done. 
yesterday they wanted me to use a mic. You know? <laughs> and so I had to hold it and hold the book and at one point the bride held it for me so I could read, <laughs> which is, she volunteered. I'm like, okay, that's great. You hold it, you know, but uh, it helped to ease her nervousness. Not that I wasn't nervous. I mean, you, you do it so many times, but you do, you know, you still get nervous. But a beautiful song, Charlie, and, and uh, good encouragement. So the scripture for the call to worship this morning is in your bulletin. And it's one that we're very familiar with. And a call to worship is an invitation for us to turn to the Lord. We come to church not just to be spoken to, but we come into a building and we all should turn our hearts to the Lord. And just, he gathers among us with this great promise from Matthew 18, 20, that where two or three gather, are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. I am in the midst of them. Great promise uh, that Jesus made. And when you think about all of the times that people, his people have gathered for 2,000 years and gathered in his name all over the world, uh, small groups, churches that are large and filled, or churches that, that are small, his presence is there, and he promised that he would. And I had a quote here from William Barclay. He is past now, but he was a, a teacher, a Bible teacher from Scotland. And he wrote a study Bible, and actually the scripture that I'm using today is from a Barclay. Uh, it's, and again, you know, uh, but I like this. He, quote, uh, said, Jesus is just as much present in a little congregation as in a great mass meeting. He is there wherever faithful hearts meet and however few they may be. Amen? He is with us. So we're gonna look, we're gonna sing a song today and, and I remember this, I haven't sung this in a while, but when I first became a believer up in York Beach in Maine, we attended this little mountain church, uh, Reverend Pastor Stevens and um, Stanley Stevens and and he really had you know he would hold on to that pulpit because he couldn't stand very well but I remember this this song and he would love to bellow it out and there was just a handful in that old country church but the thing about Pastor Stevens was that he he prayed wherever you were and he met you whether it was in the supermarket at a gas station he would have a word of prayer with you and he used to do that to my mother you know who was raised Catholic and wasn't used to that but uh, but Pastor Stevens was great so what a wonderful 287 uh, 287 a great uh, the, what a change in my life since Jesus came in let's stand and sing this if you'd like What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart 
There's a light in the valley of death now for me since Jesus came into my heart. And the gates of the city beyond I can see since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er oh my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. I shall go there to dwell in the city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy, as on would I go, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. You may be seated. That's what he used to do. He on that sea billows roll. God bless him. He's passed now, but he probably would have. But a man that he and his wife had had troubles but they were filled with joy. The, the church that he built on near Mag Mount Agamenticus in southern in York County and the house was right behind it up on a hill and on an Easter Sunday morning he was having service and looked up his house burned to the ground on Easter Sunday you know but that never quenched his his spirit of joy even though he had he had to hold on to the pipe help it and really couldn't walk very well um, he really had an impact on my life in Edie's too is because that was the first pastor that we met after after asking Christ into our hearts we, we it was pastor and somebody said he was the best one for for children just coming into the Lord, you know, uh, his his sermons were definitely teaching us about Christ and growing in Christ and singing those old hymns. Uh, it was a joy, uh, Pastor Stevens, not Carl Stevens from the Bible Speaks. That was a different pastor, but this was Stanley Stevens. Okay, um, this morning I'm going to move this a little because I'm crack. It's like a neck cracking. <laughs> um, Assurance, uh, call to confession. So that's a time where, where we just want to let the word of God and this passage that I've chosen this morning speaks of a lot from, from Ephesians, speaks of a lot of things that, you know, that we slide into and we, you know, we, we need to examine ourselves really regularly just to see that we're, we're not, you know, we need forgiveness. And that's what this part of the service is, that we are called to confession. So I'm going to read that from Ephesians, but maybe it, something will touch your heart or mine. Ephesians 4, 26 to 31. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but... Rather, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for that day of redemption. Let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. So let's let that word sink in. Maybe there's just one thing, maybe there's nothing, but just let, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart as we have a time of silence before the Lord.
Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. You know where, where, where all of us are at. Let us hear your small voice, Lord, and let us, let us follow it. Let us turn from our sins. Let us repent and, and seek thy forgiveness, O God, which we know is assured according to what Christ has done on the cross for us. So speak to us this morning. And throughout our day, Lord, if we've grieved you, uh, quicken our hearts that we might turn and find thy forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray. And the assurance of forgiveness is again right from Ephesians, uh, the next verse, 31. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Amen? We have forgiveness. Okay, I'm going to sing a song. And make, this one is a little fast, but it's, a, it's kind of a proclamation song that, that our God is greater and stronger, and, and, um, and, and we need him. And it, and it mentions... Um, it mentions that Jesus turned the water to wine, and for the third time... Uh, that I've been here in, in the last uh, few uh, months. Uh, um, I'm speaking about the wedding at Cana. And this is the miracle I've spoken about, about, you know, be, Jesus being invited to the wedding uh, and Jesus, and then the words of Mary, the best advice ever, what does he say, do it, whatever he says. And this one is gonna be about the miracle. So this song goes like this, and maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. Be good if I look at the chords. I might mess up. But of our God. David said, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. So let us lift him up. Singing of the greatness of our God, he's greater than any of our problems. He is great in all of our weaknesses. When we have no strength, he is strong in us.
Amen. Amen. It's, sometimes it's good just to declare the greatness of God. It's sort of like when David spoke to his soul. You know, sometimes our soul, which is our mind and our will and our emotions, uh, they get down. You know, and we get weighed down with, uh, with situations. Just read the Psalms and see what King David had to say. Uh, and, uh, and he spoke sometimes to his soul and he just told his soul, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that it was in me. Bless his holy name. And sometimes, you know, we were, we were meant to be led by the Lord, not by our, our mind or our soul. You know, we were meant to, to, uh, to be led by God's word and God's spirit and strong inside. Uh, but we do at times get weighed down with situations. And I think that everybody is, you know, at, uh, at this point and here we are again starting another fall or beginnings of fall with COVID still in our midst. And uh, we're grateful for what, uh, how God has provided. I personally believe God has answered prayer with a vaccine and um, and you know and I would I would encourage you uh, to if you're not vaccinated I know that's become like a little football here a political thing but but it's uh, I think it's safe <laughs> I really do uh, and it would encourage people I might take some flack for that but that's okay I don't mind that uh, but um, so the scripture reading today again is 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 not the King James um, but this is the last time I'll be preaching on the wedding at Cana. Uh, but I just saw so much in this. And we remember that John, I want to remind you that John wrote this. And we believe that the Gospel of John was the last book written uh, in the New Testament. Uh, he had a chance for decades after Christ had ascended. John and went, was exiled to uh, the Isle of Patmos and there he wrote the book of Revelation. But when he came back, so he had a lot of time to think about his time with Jesus. And I think that puts sometimes in perspective his gospel because he, 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 he pinpoints things that he remembered about life with Jesus. And I've read that, that he was young. He was maybe the youngest of the disciples. So maybe even a, one in his early 20s or in, you know, fishing and Jesus had called him and then he walked with Christ and spent that and probably was the last apostle to die. Uh, but he lived until his 80s or even longer. I mean, I don't know, but I mean, I, I read that the, this is a funny thing. And I, I read that, that when they carried him, he left Patmos and went to Ephesus. I, am I right with that, Doctor? Yeah. But, right, because we don't have any exact, but they say, what I read was that, that was written a little bit afterwards, that they would carry him into a meeting. And, um, you know, he was old and he would just mumble, love one another. That's what he, and they would, they would say, well, we know that, but that's the, that, love one another. You know, you know, John's epistles are too, and it's all about love. Here's the, the son of thunder in the beginning, but Jesus had so changed his heart that, that he was all about love. And that's really what Jesus said the bottom line was, didn't he? Really, you know, this is the most important thing, love God and love one another, you know? And we've read today, forgive one another. You know, as Christ forgave you, that's what Paul said. So I'm going to read this text from uh, for Cana, and we're going to focus today on, on the miracle. John 2, verses 1 through 11. Two days later, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus was also was invited and his disciples. Now the wine ran short, whereupon the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Leave the matter in my hands, he replied. The time for me to act is not yet come. And his mother said to the attendants, Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now there were six stone jars standing there in accordance with the Jewish regulations for purification, each large enough to hold 20 gallons or more. Big, 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 used for, for cleansing. Jesus said to the attendants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And then he said, now take some out and carry it to the master of the feast. 
So they carried it some to him. No sooner had the master tasted the water, now turned into wine. Then, not knowing where it came from, though the attendants who had drawn the water knew, he called to the bridegroom, and he said to them, It is usual to put on the good wine first, when people have drunk freely, then with that which is inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of, of miracles Jesus performed at Cana and Galilee, and thus displayed his glorious power, and his disciples believed in him. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. I'll talk about that later. But we're going to take our offering time. Charlie's going to do an offertory. And so we can do that now. We're thankful for the way you support this church. And those who are watching, supporting the First Baptist of Bennington here. Charlie, would you play an offering, offertory for us? Let's stand and sing doxology. Let's worship the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him you father god you are our provider you provide what we need in our lives we look to you and trust in you i thank you for this church that also trusts in you these people here lord i thank you for the offering that has been given this morning lord god i pray that you would bless it that you'd give wisdom to those who who you have ordained would be the ones that decide where this offering goes but Lord, again, we trust in you and we thank you for your provision for our lives and your church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. We're going to have a time of prayer now, so I'm going to take some uh, prayer requests uh, from you this morning. I also, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Amen. You believe God answers prayer? Amen. He does. We pray that he answers things in his way, but nonetheless, he beckons us to ask. And so, as I said, this is the last of three sermons that I'm going to preach on, on John 2, the narrative of the wedding at Cana. And I would remind you, it's a great text, you know, and sometimes that happens with pastors that you look at a text and you see more than one scripture there. I've, I've known pastors that have been in the book of Romans like their whole ministry, you know. And, uh, but there's just, you know, there are things that we need from the Bible. And so and I saw that they invited Jesus to a wedding. 
I told the couple yesterday, I said, you can never go wrong with inviting Jesus to your wedding, but you can never go wrong with inviting him into your life and into your marriage and into all the situations that we have. This is a sermon I already preached here. His presence makes all the difference when we're down, when we don't even feel his presence and we, and we call upon him, he's there. And then I preached on, on running low. They ran out of wine. They were running low on it. And, and, and sometimes in our lives we run low on strength. We feel that you know, we're waning and we're, we're just getting out of us. And we can always go and, and do what he says. That was the advice that his mother gave. Whatever he says, do it. And that would encompass the whole word of God. The God the, God's word is a guidebook for our lives. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But we must follow that. It's not about just knowing his word or hearing him, his commands, but it's about doing them and following him. And it makes all the difference. And Jesus knows what's best. And so today we want to just think about the miracle, the amazing miracle of his first recorded miracle. I mean, we know uh, that's what John said. This was his first. And it had an impact on his, on his life. The disciples at the text said that, 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 that his glory was revealed there. And they saw him for who he really was. And they believed in him. Okay? So seeing Christ... Uh, it's uh, the miracle that the, you know, so I, I always come up with a, a bunch of different titles to sermons. You know, I don't know. We have a sermon title, but all I could think of was the miracle of Christ's abundance. Because Jesus said these words once. He said, A thief in John 10:10, 10, 10, a thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life. For the sheep. So Jesus here says that he, he, he came that we might have abundant life. And I think maybe some of us struggle to figure out and to realize what does that mean, abundant life? Because sometimes we don't feel like we have abundant life. Things seem to go wrong in our lives, that we, we struggle at times, and our life is filled with sometimes trials and tribulations. I met a woman yesterday who who was at the wedding and, and I've known her for years and she had a husband years ago that was struggled so much that he committed suicide and then she married again a Christian man and then this man had stroke after stroke after stroke so he you know and then when I saw her I said it's good to see you and and we talked about things and she said you know things got really tough for me you know, and, and I was angry at God. And I was, you know, why, 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 why? And then in the midst of, she was in a hospital waiting room, she just sort of collapsed and, and gave it to God and God's peace came upon her. But why I say that is that even in the midst of what does abundant life mean? Is, is, it, it's, it's, we know that we have salvation in Christ, amen? We know that we have, when, when we pass, that our life is going to go on in eternity. And just knowing that sometimes. Now this is all the life that we know, what we live. And that is filled at times with, with trials and situations. But he never leaves us, does he? He said, I will never leave you. I will be with you. And he's going to always. So, I mean, that's really what I see abundant life is knowing the promises of God, knowing the presence of God, knowing that my life has a purpose and that someday I'm going to go to be with him. And, and that, that's what I need to focus on versus is at times whatever our pain may be or whatever our situation, you know. But abundance makes me think of the, the wedding of uh, the, the miracle but it also makes me think of Psalm 23, where David said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's abundant life. 
is the mercy and goodness of God following us all the days of our lives. We may not see it ahead of us, but when we look behind, we see that, that God's mercy was there for me. His goodness is there for me. And I'm going to dwell in the house, and you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? That's a promise. And the miracle of that cup running over, that, that thought of David's from Psalm 23, reminds me of this miracle. I mean, they, were, they ran out of wine. We know that. Oh, they were, yeah, they were running low, and then they ran out. And Jesus took control, even though, the, even though the, he said, it's not my time, uh, he dealt with it anyways. And so they had these big jars, big jars that filled 20 to 30 gallons of water. It was meant to be for uh, the Jewish people at the time were very into purification, washing hands, washing feet, you know, so there were these jars there. And, and Jesus the, said, fill them up. So you do the math. There were six of them that could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Okay? That's a lot of wine, folks. <laughs> okay? I mean, 20 to 30 ga uh, gallons in each of them would come out to 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Wow. Okay? When I was at the wedding yesterday and, and I commented on this, I said, well, he probably to today he would turn the water into Bud Light, you know, <laughs> because of what they, you know, it, but anyways, you know. But so much wine, so much wine, an abundance of wine, and it was at the end of the wedding. If you remember that, you know, it, this was, this 120 to 180 gallons was at the end of the wedding. Save for the best for last. Wow. It was a miracle. Christ did lots of miracles, didn't he? Think about that. Because miracles, even though we don't may, maybe see some, I believe that they're happening anyways. Just that the fact that I'm standing here is a miracle. I mean, you know, just that the Lord would call somebody like me to be a pastor. And, and you know, I, I mean, that's a miracle in itself. But, but anyways, Jesus did them. And he did lots of them. And let me remind you of a few of them, okay? He fed thousands of people twice, remember that? With loaves and fishes, okay? Imagine being in that crowd. He cast demons out. Many, many times he set people free from demonic activity. He healed the blind, the deaf, the sick, the injured. Sometimes everyone in town, they would bring them. They heard Jesus. This was a problem. There were so many people. But he would heal them all, it said. Okay? He had power over the fierce storm. He calmed the storm. Sometimes he needs to calm the storms in our lives. But he's powerful. He, he, he affected the fish. He raised people from the dead. A young man was brought back to life, the son of a widow, a leader's daughter in the synagogue, Lazarus, and, the, and another one. And he rose from the dead himself. These things are all recorded in the scriptures for us to look at. And they build up our faith when we see them. They built just like they encourage the faith of the disciples at that wedding. It says they saw that and they believed in him. This was the beginning of turning water to wine. Why did Jesus do miracles? I'll tell you what I think he, why he did them. Because he loved people and he cared about them. As he cares and as he loves you and he cared about us. Miracles also revealed in the scriptures the glory of God, his divinity, his sovereignty over creation and over nature. This is our God. This is the Jesus we put our faith in and trust in. His miracles also provided an opportunity for many, many people to come. They might have been coming to look for, for, for a miracle for their lives, but they came to hear the gospel too. He was able to tell of, of the kingdom of God and reveal the Father to them. 
So the miracles became like something that would bring people to him and he would do that and, and he would tell them about why, who he was, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He said those as miracles. And when we read the word of God, we see these things and they would encourage us. Remember that the Bible says that with God, nothing is impossible. I don't know what you're going through at this time, but sometimes we need to know that with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Jesus looked at them at one point and said, with men, this is impossible with God. But why so much wine? Well, I'm going to just briefly talk about the symbolism that I see here. The symbols. What does wine symbolize? In the Bible, I believe it symbolizes two things. And maybe looking at those and thinking about those will encourage us. One is the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit. Wine is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Remember on the day of Pentecost, when, when the Spirit of God fell upon the disciples in the upper room, they came out into the streets and people, and they started to speak the gospel in many different languages. People heard the gospel. And people said, well, these guys are drunk. That's what Peter, uh, however, some and from Acts 2, some made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. And Peter said, no, they haven't had too much wine. These men are not drunk. As you suppose, he said, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Don't exactly know what that means. But, but the, there is a symbol there of wine. And Jesus, and then he quoted, he said, in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all, on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men dream dreams. And on your servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So there's symbolism here of the, the Holy Spirit and wine. Jesus spoke of that once when he said that you cannot put new wine into new wineskins. No one puts new wine into an old wineskin or else the new wine will burst the wineskins. But, but the new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. And that was really describing in a deeper way, I could preach a sermon on what he meant by that. But he was really, in a sense, again, kind of, I think, referring to the newness of the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. You can't put that into the old system. It must be, we're in a time now of, 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 of the time of grace and truth, and the fullness of the Holy Spirit is upon the church right now. We need to remember that. And Paul would say, do not be drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be under the influence, rather than be under the influence of wine, be under the influence of God's Spirit. And that's important for us to know that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives right now. He is God present within us. And He is so important and that we understand that. And some of us think of the Holy Spirit as just a doctrine of the church. But it's the living presence of Christ within us. He is there to guide our lives. He is there to be our, uh, to show us and guide us into truth. He is there to work. So when we pick up the Bible and we read the Bible, we are to, we are to, to know that we have a resident teacher within us. And we should read the Bible with the understanding that God, speak to me from this scripture. What do I need right now? You'll be amazed at how God will. And that's what Jesus said. He will guide you into truth. So we need to know that this, the fullness of the Spirit abundantly upon us, like an abundance of wine, so an abundance of God's Spirit is there for us to change our lives too. As I preached before, that the Spirit of God is, is in us to change us, to, to build the, to we, the fruit of His Spirit, love and joy and peace and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. That's all part of the Spirit working within my life and your life, no matter how old you are. We still keep growing. The Spirit is also given that we have abilities, gifts. 
not to be ignorant of them. Paul said, dear brothers, I don't want you to misunderstand the gifts of the Spirit. Many of you who attend church are gifted people, anointed by God. Every one of us is, has spiritual gifts. And I see them here as I've gotten to know some of you that are in leadership, or, or, but all have ministries to do. And those, are, again, the abundance of the Spirit of God is in you. You're looking at a person, when you look at me, as somebody that never went to college, I went to college one semester and dropped out. No sem but I found Christ, I sought the Word of God, I heard the call to be a pastor, I, 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 I pastored a church for a year, then they ordained me, and then I passed at another church, as I've said before, for, for 25 years, the Community Church of Whitingham. And for 20 of those years, I was the pastor of two churches, in Amer both American Baptist churches. So they recognized my ordination. But that's just the gift of God in me. I never played the guitar before. But I'm, but I'm just using myself as an illustration. God uses all of you. You have gifts in there of the Holy Spirit. You are anointed. Charlie's anointed. Alan's anointed. Okay? But his wife is too, and my wife is too. And you may say, well, I don't know my gifts. Well, just make yourself available to God. Continue. And God uses my wife. Sometimes she says, well, what's my... She wants to know. But he's used her all these years. I couldn't have done my ministry without her. And, 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 or any of you. Make yourselves available to God. There's an abundance of the Spirit of God is upon us. But don't quench the Spirit. And don't grieve the Spirit. Those are both scriptures. Just make yourself available. And, and finally, there's another illustration that's, that we need so much. That the abundance of wine. Maybe Jesus, you know, Jesus did things at times that later on they understood what they meant. Very few people saw that miracle there. The disciples did, and the servants, and his mother maybe, but nobody else. He wasn't doing this for a show. We know now, but the miracle of making water into wine. I told the couple yesterday, I said, life without Christ is like water, but life with Christ is like wine. Good wine. Good wine. There's a big difference. And he demonstrated, we, we, we look back at this wedding and we see this abundance of wine. I don't know what they used it for. Certainly God didn't want them to get all drunk with it. But it probably the water wasn't good and maybe, maybe took, people took a gallon home, I don't know. But it's abundant. And the other illustration of the symbol of wine in the Bible is what? The blood of Christ shed for our forgiveness our forgiveness Jesus took the cup and the cup of wine and gave thanks and said drink from it all of you this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins how much do we need his forgiveness amen every single day we still need to be forgiven we still need to be remembered the whole world is forgiven for one reason alone that Christ offered himself upon the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins none of us should go around with guilt on us there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not in the flesh but in the spirit so much forgiveness is needed but there's an abundance of forgiveness offered for all of your sins. Christ paid the price for all of us. An abundance of forgiveness. Listen to these words. Once for all, he died. Once for all, Hebrews. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkling of blood, Sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I like that as a song, the blood speaks a better words. 
We, and this one from Hebrews. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. And that may be the symbolism of taking away, Professor Allen might, might agree, taking away of the old, the water, which was the Jewish way of things, and changing it to the wine. See that? And that's what Hebrew says. He takes away the first. No longer do we need all the rules and regulations of the old covenant. And he establishes the new covenant and changes the water to the wine, which is mean the forgiveness of our sins. That we, from Hebrews 10, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that which we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And Hebrews 9, 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Think of that. Think of your life and my life, that we are all sinners saved by grace. And at times we, there is past, there is present, and there will be future times when we will fall and stumble and sin, and we will need to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, based on your blood, forgive me, and he will. What does John say? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Amen? There's a great hymn. We're not going to sing it, but I'm going to quote it to you. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn with Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Amen? You got no stains on you. You got no you got white. When God looks at you now, he sees Christ. He sees his son's sacrifice. He no longer sees your sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. He no longer remembers them. We remember them all the time. We remember others' sins. But God chooses not to remember because... In closing, remember that so much wine could represent the anointing of God's Holy Spirit upon our life. The fullness of the Holy Spirit. He is resident within us. Endued with power to live the Christian life and to serve Christ. And so much grace, so much love, so much forgiveness was in the cross and was in that the blood that Christ said. And so we now have seen his glory. Amen? We see it in the word. We see it in what he said and what he has done from us. And we believe. Amen? And our faith is strengthened by that. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this miracle that revealed the glory of Christ. And as the disciples believed, so we now remember. And we have your promises in the word that causes us to believe. And we believe them. Thank you. In Jesus, your name I pray. Amen. And amen. Well, that's only part of what I was going to preach on. <laughs> We're going to sing a... a we're going to sing a great hymn. Another one. I think I've sung this before. That last one, you know, whoever used this hymn book, and it's probably been used by pastors going way back into the 80s. People used to, used to, uh, to mark down what, 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 they, what Sunday they sang it. You know? But the last one that we sang, um, since Jesus came into my heart, only had one time that it was sung here. So maybe you haven't heard it that much, or maybe a pastor didn't write it down. But this, a wonderful Savior, is Jesus my Lord. My goodness, it goes back to, sang it in 88.
in 90, twice in 91, once in 93, 95, 96, 06 twice, 07 twice, and 08. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Let's stand and sing it. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for that image, that word that as you covered and held uh, Moses in the cleft of the rock, Lord, that we might feel thy hands around us, that we might see that we are in your hands and we put our lives in your hands as we leave this service today. I thank you that you go with us. So let me sense your presence this week, uh, presence of the Spirit of the living God, and know your forgiveness this week. I pray for this congregation and those watching in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Nice being here with you today. I'll, I'll see you in a month.